the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Jesse Abramson, noted sports writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Asa Bushnell, Secretary of the United States Olympic Committee. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Bushnell, after many very serious uh, political shows, I'm sure that our audience will welcome a talk about sports and good fellowship and the possibility of making some friends this summer. Glad now, to be sir, able to take part in a little change of pace for you. Now, sir, uh, will you uh, tell our audience just briefly? Will you fill us in on the background of the Olympic Games? Just what are the Olympic Games, sir? The Olympic Games are a a series of athletic contests held originally in ancient Greece for some 1,200 years prior to the year 400 A.D. They were abandoned when politics began to balk a little too large in the And, and when, when did the modern Olympic Games begin? Olympic, the modern Games were revived or in 1896. And, 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 and except, and then of course there were war years in which there were no games held. 1916. In modern times, the Olympic Games, unfortunately, have been suspended on account of war. In the old days, wars were suspended for the benefit of the Olympic Games. I see. Now, this year, this is 1952, and where will the Games be held this year? Helsinki, Finland. I see. And, and uh, you have, you've already had the Winter Games, and now, talking of the Games, you mean the summer events in Helsinki? The summer events are thought of as the Olympic Games proper. The, the, uh, Winter events are always referred to as the Winter Games. It, They're a subsidiary of the Olympic Games. Isn't that because the Winter Olympics were added to the program as uh, late as 1920, I believe, for the first time, Mr. Bushnell? That's correct, Mr. Abramson. The, uh, the first uh, several Olympic Games celebrations included no winter sports. And now, there's been a, a conception in our country that, that we have won most of the Olympic Games, or all of them. Is, is that a, a proper conception, sir? Well, no one wins the Olympic Games, Mr. Huey. The, uh, the games are made up of separate individual contests in which uh, there is an individual or a team winner, but there is no, no national winner of the Olympic Games. Now, now this summer, of course, uh, approximately how many American athletes will, will participate in the games? There'll be something over 300 uh, if we are able to amass the necessary funds to send all of them to Helsinki. I see. Now, these 300 people are going to Helsinki and compete there, and they're going to live with athletes from other countries? The uh, basic idea of the Olympic Games is to summon the youth of the world to a meeting point uh, for friendly contact and competition. They'll now, all I'm live sure together in the Olympic Village. I see. Now, I'm sure that our audience would like to know something about the actual events and what our chances are and the chances of our star athletes. Uh, who is expected to make the best uh, showing for, or win the most gold medals for us this summer? Well, I assume that you think first, Mr. Huey, as most of the people in this country do, of track and field. So your question probably is directed to track and field. I May I interrupt, Mr. Bushnell? You say men's track and field because we have generally had a very poor women's track and field team. Well, when we say track and field, we mean the men's team, Mr. Abramson. Uh, when we say women's track and field, that's the women's team. Well, well now, pardon me. I think that in uh, men's track and field, uh, it's my impression, isn't it uh, yours, Mr. Bushnell, that uh, we will be just as strong in 1952 as we have been ever since the Olympic Games were reorganized in 1896? I think we have a wealth of material in a great many of the events in the track and field program. Not all of them, as you well know, but uh, 
a good many of the events, we have a number of the leading contenders. Well, who has been the mo who is the most outstanding of all American Olympic uh, stars? For the present day? I mean, no, sir. Oh, in, in modern Olympics. Well, I should think uh, Jesse Owens from his performance in the 1936 Games in Berlin when he won four gold medals. I think he deserves that designation, although Mr. Abramson may have some other feeling the matter. Well, he, Mr. Huey said American uh, athlete. I would have to go along with you on Jesse Owens if you said an American athlete. But if you widen the field to others, I would have to possibly take issue with you, Mr. Bushnell, and include uh, Pavo Nurmi of Finland, who well, also won four gold medals in one Olympic meet, as did Jesse Owens in 1936. Well, if, if we had to pick the outstanding uh, modern Olympic star, would it be Nurmi or would it be Jesse Owens? I think we'd make out a good case for either one. We need a lot of time to discuss and debate that question because they were both uh, men who won four gold medals in one meet and no one else ever did except Jesse Owens and Pava Nurmi. Well, now, do we have uh, a likelihood of, of, of a repeat performance? Do we have a Jesse Owens on our team this year? I don't see that in prospect, although to go back to one question you asked a moment ago, it would seem to me that Bob Richards, the 15-foot pole vaulter, is perhaps our outstanding individual candidate at the present time for the track and field team. He not only excels in the pole vault, but he's also progressing in the decathlon and should make a good showing in that. Possibly only the second best showing in the world because we have the uh, defender from 1948, Bob Mathias of Stanford. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Bushnell? Definitely, Mr. Abramson. I don't think we can dis discount Bob Mathias. He'll certainly be a leading candidate for the decathlon gold medal. I'm sure that our, our listeners have, uh, have noted that this year we expect to have the Russians compete. Now, have the Russians ever competed before? Russia has never been represented as such in, in past Olympic That's even in Tsarist days and Correct, now in, in the Soviet this, days. This will be the, the first occasion. Now, in sports circles, is that regarded as something that's quite hopeful that the Russians are planning to compete? Yes, we feel that uh, whenever uh, competitors from the different nations come together in the Olympic Games, they, they are bound to uh, develop friendships which cannot help being reflected uh, and their, their country folk back home. And, and so how, how do you and Mr. Abramson think that the, uh, that the Russians will do in the track and field events this summer? I would defer to Mr. Abramson as far as that, the answer to that question is concerned. I think he would be a better one to speak up. What, what well, are the possibilities? Mr. Bushnell, so far as we know uh, from reports emanating from Russia, the, I do not think they will be in our general class in men's track and field, limiting the uh, discussion to men's track and field because I believe the Russians have the greatest women athletes in the world and we do not go in for developing women athletes, not in track and field anyhow. Well, why is it that we haven't developed great women athletes? Well, it's not part uh, of, I believe uh, Mr. Bushnell will bear me out, that it, because it's not part of our college program and um, not part of, it. we do not have the same system in women's track and field as we have in men's track and very field. Very little opportunity for women track and field athletes to have competition, very little chance for development. Well, why shouldn't Radcliffe and Vassar and Wellesley and the rest of the women's colleges go in for um, women's track and field? Well, Mr. Bushnell? I don't know the answer to that. They don't. <laughs> Now, uh, do, you, do you expect that the Russians will send their athletes and that they will live together with ours? That is, the, uh, that is the uh, normal procedure. Uh, athletes of all the countries come together. They not only compete together, but also live together well, in now, the Olympic Village. I'm, I hope that certainly would be a hopeful development. Now, there's the problem of money. And, of course, you, as, uh, as commissioner of the Eastern College Athletic Conference and as secretary, you are interested in how, how we're going to get the money. Now, I believe that our athletes are sent by private subscription, aren't they? That's correct, Mr. Healy. There's uh, no government money involved. Most of the countries in the world uh, do help subsidize uh, their teams for Olympic Games competition, but uh, in the United Kingdom and in the United States, uh, there is no such arrangement of that sort. We must depend entirely upon popular subscription, gifts, well, and donations. How much, money, how much money is needed? Our budget uh, reached what, what is for us an astronomical figure of uh, 850000 for the 1952 Games, both Winter Games and uh, Olympic Games and how, proper. How, how do we propose to raise it? We get uh, some of our money from... Uh, gate receipts at the more popular tryouts, the tryouts in the more popular sports. But the 
the great uh, bulk of the money must come from individual contributions from sports-minded people, from individuals throughout the country who want to make certain that uh, our team will be able to make the trip without leaving anyone now, behind. Do either you or Mr. Abramson have any suggestions as to how our audience, our sp sports-minded people among our audience, can help raise that money? Well, we'll be very happy to receive uh, checks and any, any amount from any one of them. Mr. Bushnell, I have an idea that might be helpful. Uh, there's been a lot of agitation against the college football games and the postseason basketball tournaments, and it's a great rush every uh, four years to get this money together. Why don't you, uh, as commissioner of the Eastern College Athletic Conference, uh, suggest that the uh, uh, football bowls and the basketball tournaments turn over a good share of their receipts to the Olympic Fund which is an American uh, system. A smart suggestion, and it would uh, well, help in is, many ways. Is there, is there to be an event in, in the New York area anytime soon in which uh, people can help? There is an Olympic carnival, a five-sport carnival, to be held at Madison Square Garden on Saturday night. With featuring Dick Button, Mr. Bushnell, and the greatest track and field athletes, we, the greatest track athletes, in as much as it's only a six-race program that we well, have I'm, in this country. I'm, I'm sure that our audience has appreciated your being with us tonight, Mr. Bushnell and Mr. Abramson, and thank you very much, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Lone Gene Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Jesse Abramson. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Asa Bushnell, Secretary of the United States Olympic Committee. The Longines Whitnor Watch Company was happy to afford Mr. Asa Bushnell this opportunity on the Longines Chronoscope to present the United States Olympic Committee's need for funds. Now, our own company will certainly make a contribution <coughs> and will, in addition, provide superlative timing equipment for all of the trials of the 18 separate sports events which will be represented in the United States Olympic team. This will require some 60, one-tenth of a second, Longines Olympic timers with a value of $30,000. These Longines Olympic timers are considered to be the finest of all sports timing watches for all sports and each watch has its own accuracy bulletin from a government observatory. Now, for certain events, we will also make available these certified Longines wrist and pocket chronographs. The choice by the United States Olympic Committee of Longines watches to time all events for the selection of the 1952 United States Olympic team is assurance that any records made will have international acceptance. The reputation for accuracy of Longines watches rests on a solid record of achievement. Longines watches of all categories have been classified first by the leading government observatories over the past 75 years. So if you wish to buy for yourself or as a gift just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to be with us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longine. This is Frank Knight again, reminding you that Longine and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.